All right. Good morning, all. Welcome back. So we can talk about 10 of the trending articles in the crypto news space today. As always, links to everything down in the description so you can do your own research and learn for yourself. Uh, don't just trust people like me. Actively go looking. Um, none of us have all the answers, and we're all just a bunch of people with very few qualifications, quite honestly. So, uh, yeah, and thanks to all those who have subscribed. I really do appreciate it. You have no idea how much it means. So, let's hop in and talk about article number one. So, Quant Stamp CEO Richard Ma gave a new interview, and he's saying that Cardano is going to become the second largest DeFi platform behind Ethereum. According to his statement, Cardano offers clear advantages over competitor Tezos, which he puts in third place. I'm going to be honest with you. I feel like this article used DeFi as a buzzword, get a bit more clicks, but hey, what do you know? That's what you got to do sometimes. So let's get into it, and I'll, I'll let you know why I was thinking that. So in his opinion, Mr. Ma, he believes Cardano has source code that is among the best in the entire blockchain sector. Uh, it's clear they've put a lot of internal effort to solidify tests and properly engineer the code, and it's really shown through the smooth launch. We recently audited Prism for Ethereum 2.0, and we would say that in terms of quality, similar to Prism, it, Cardano, is one of the best code bases we've seen. Uh, the move to the Shelley era means Cardano will be the second most popular smart contract platform, second only to Ethereum by the end of the year. As a proof-of-stake system, it now dwarfs Tezos. And see, that's where I'm saying they're using DeepFi kind of as a buzzword, because he's really talking about smart contracts in general. But DeFi heavily, 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 heavily uses smart contracts. So the jump that they made to that, it, it, it makes sense, I'm just saying. So, uh, But yeah, no, Hoskinson uh, has announced smart contracts and native assets on the block Cardano blockchain will be released by the end of this year. Uh, Cardano will have a significant va advantage over its competitors through the new Hydra off-chain protocol, which allows transactions to be processed quickly and inexpensively with a lower latency than Ethereum. Uh, Cardano or Cardano guru and founder Charles Hoskinson actually is saying that Hydra could bring it to sub-second latency, which would be insane. Um, Ethereum transactions on DeFi platforms can take a few more a few more seconds than most people would like also DeFi is pushing ethereum to its technical limits so if cardano can launch smart contracts by the end of the year and they truly are a lower latency than ethereum we could see new DeFi projects i mean i'm sure we will um, i'm sure the cardano team is working on one uh as we speak right now that can be launched once smart contracts go live with the drop of I believe Gogan by the end of this year so really good news for Cardano because if they can pull it off just based on their code base alone this guy's thinking that they could uh, they could be number two and if Ethereum doesn't get a move on they could eventually be number one just my opinion though um, I do love both projects I just think Cardano is doing a much better job right now of future proofing and developing itself than Ethereum is. Just my opinion. Alrighty, well, hey, let's hop on over to article number two. So, MasterCard and Alibaba. Oh boy, they're going to be using VeChain to track food and wine. So, they're developing a platform based on the VeChain blockchain to authenticate and track the supply chain. This platform will use the VeChain Thor blockchain to track products and MasterCard provenance as the ver transaction verification ledger. So interesting, they're kind of be pairing up. So this is done through the Australian, uh, God, what's it called? The a APC Provincial Council. So Australian media report reveals plans by Giants MasterCard and Alibaba to deepen its partnership with the APAC Provincial Council or APC. Both companies join forces to develop and launch a protocol to facilitate tracking food, wine, and exports that are produced in Australia. The platform will be based on VeChain Thor uh, to track products and will use MasterCard's provenance as the ledger. So the, a the APC is a consortium for food supply 
and financing in the Asia Pacific Economic Region. Its main objective is to create an efficient intercontinental financial ecosystem, and its main partner for applying blockchain technology is VeChain. So VeChain is getting paired up with a pretty large, I mean, their goals for the Southeast Asia region, specifically in trade between Australia and China, is a lot. I believe it counts for like over $50 billion a year. So this is pretty nice. If this can um, come to fruition and be good, this is a real use case for VeChain and another reason why they are doing so gosh darn well. So the objective of the platform developed by them is based, is for these Australian Chinese exports, as I already said. Oh, and actually says 76 billion annually. So the APC co-founder David Indarius outlined, uh, the overall theme of this is making more resilient export supply chains. One current complexity is COVID. The other is the economic and political trade circumstances, especially with China. Yeah, uh, tensions are on the rise between China and a lot of other Western, quote unquote, governments due to well, uh, any number of things treatment of the Uyghurs uh, trade you know the simmering trade war between the USA and China that Trump keeps uh, reigniting when he feels it suits him but yeah there's definitely um, some interesting ways that this program could help them save money um, in the current climate so an Australian government roadmap identified blockchain technology as a core solution to improve the agricultural supply chain. Uh, last week, major companies such as Kellogg's, Mars, Coles, NAB, JBS, and IAG, among others, joined to make a $10 million investment in the APC to fund VeChain Thor based solutions to reinvent the business model to be used after the pandemic. Food Agility CRC Chef Executive chief executive wow i said chef i need more coffee so uh the big issue in the food industry right now is the supply chains the situation in china is making people think about diversifying their market the other is data showing the provenance of the product is really important in these sorts of markets when you put a digital lens on the supply chain it allows say a meat processor to provide information back to the farmer which of course is not something that happens very often right now so they want to work you know with technology to help expedite these things and allow data to flow backwards and forwards. So that way everyone along the chain can use it to help improve and also to verify where products come from. Again, VeChain is getting heavily, heavily into the supply chain market, which is a multi-trillion dollar industry. It's a good move for them um, and I could really see it paying off dividends for them down the line. Heck, in my opinion, it already has. So there you go. Bit more VeChain news continuing to get more partnerships, more development, more this, more that, more just about everything. But hey, let's hop on over to article number three and talk about Chainlink. So Chainlink unveiled a new partnership to integrate Oracle services on the DLT platform provide. Uh, developers will be able to access premium Chainlink data, build on the platform, and run nodes. Uh, and the price of Chainlink is up about 15% after this. I don't think it's fully because of this, but it helps. So according to the press release, developers who will benefit from the partnership will be able to access Chainlink data streaming using the Provide API. Um, according to this, the partnership with Provide will further strengthen Ch Chainlink's position as the de facto standard for Oracle services in smart contracts through the baseline protocol. In that sense, the partner said that they will continue working to increase the support of the Oracle API and node orchestration. As we talked about yesterday, there are some competitors to Chainlink. Uh, Dia was the one we talked about yesterday, but Chainlink is still the big guy and the de facto ruler of all things Oracle. So Chainlink's head of business development, David Cochise, further outlined, uh, we're excited to accelerate the adoption of Chainlink Oracles in the enterprise space by working with Provide. They not only offer enterprises an API for consuming Chainlink data and turnkey development of Chainlink nodes, but Provide helps abstract the, you, what, 
abstract away the use of cryptocurrency by allowing enterprises to pay with traditional payment methods while still facilitating native crypto payments to blockchain infrastructure providers. Woo, that is quite the mouthful. Basically saying is we make it nice, quick, and easy, and you can pay us in cold, hard cash if you don't want to do crypto. I mean, it works. That's probably the best way to do it. Um, a lot of these businesses are wanting to dip their toes into the crypto space. Um, and if they can kind of experiment with the use of blockchain oracles without having to further invest in cryptocurrencies to just pay to, for the ability to use them, it's, it eliminates a step and anything helps. So, um, 24 hours after the announcement with provide Chainlink's price rose by 15.21%. Time of publication, it's trading at $9.62 with weekly gains of 36% and monthly gains of 100 which, bam. Uh, Chainlink's actually uh, nipping at Litecoin and Cardano's heels, if I remember what cryptocurrency market cap was showing me before I booted this up. So, yeah, it's uh, they're doing pretty well. I mean, really well. I don't even know how else to describe it. They are on fire and it's because they're providing real strong real world use cases and honestly i think a lot of it has to do with this DeFi explosion for Chainlink. so as long as DeFi is doing well Chainlink will be too but hey let's hop over and talk about ripple for a hot second here so sales of ripple's xrp token in quarter two surge after hitting a low in q1 while the firm's on-demand liquidity network remains pretty popular According to Ripple's quarterly report released on August the 3rd, sales of the firm's XRP token were 18.6 times higher in Q2 compared to Q1. Uh, they said the sales were due to the firm prioritizing over-the-counter, over-programmatic ones. This is reportedly part of the effort to provide increased XRP liquidity to, Ripple's, to RippleNet's on-demand liquidity customers, or ODL customers. So basically, they're selling Ripple at a very high rate, but they're doing it over the counter. So it's not really affecting Ripple's price, but it does help provide liquidity to all their partners because they now have access to extra ones. So, so Coin Telegraph reported today that the price of XRP has rallied 40% in the past seven days and nearly eight and a half in the last 24 hours. Many predict the token may even surge to 30 cents if Bitcoin remains stable which I think it will, barring anything crazy happening. Uh, Ripple is currently in the middle of a long-running class action lawsuit, as many of you may know, alleging the firm misled investors with bullish claims about XRP and sold the token as an unregistered security. Cointelegraph recently reported that the legal team representing the firm and CEO Brad Garlinghouse has argued any statements they made overstating the utility of the XRP token cannot be proven false. They're basically saying, yeah, we said some stuff, but it wasn't false, and you can't prove it. Na 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 na. Which, I don't know. But anyways, just another awesome, amazing story about XRP and how it is really just rocking the market recently right now. It's had quite the uh, lull for the past, like, year and a half. I mean, all the coins have, just based on this extended bear market, but XRP really went dark. Like, I felt like for a while there, back in 2017, 2018, I was hearing something about XRP almost every day. And then I suddenly started going weeks without hearing a peep. And it looks like they're now starting to get active again. Which what I hope means is they've gotten to a point where they feel confident in themselves and where the coin is and is going to go, that they feel like they can talk about it a bit more. And, hey, no, that's good. That is really good. But hey, let's hop over to article number five and talk about Bitcoin in Japan. So, of course, everything going on in the world right now, they've discovered that traders in Japan have shied away from cryptocurrencies amidst the economic uncertainties, and account openings in crypto have declined, actually gone down for the first time in two years. However, the industry analyst says the trend's unlikely to continue. Uh, so yeah, BitBank reported that uh, fiat outflows from Japanese exchanges saw an overall decrease compared to other all years, while active, quote-unquote, 
trading accounts went down for the first time. Uh, yeah, they went down. I mean, not a crazy amount, but they did go down. Uh, BitBank said that the coronavirus pandemic, a poor economic outlook, and a lack of stimulus for citizens served as crucial reasons behind the account purge. So a good chunk of investors may have withdrawn all their funds from crypto exchanges to scrape up some cash. Yeah, pretty simple. Uh, BitBank analyst Yuva Hasuega said that this is unlikely to be a long-term solution. Uh, Bitcoin volumes and retail activity have increased ever since the Japanese equity market stopped plummeting, uh, which shows crypto traders and investors are not necessarily losing interest. You know, they are just probably pulling their stuff out to make sure they had it on hand for if things got really, really bad. So. Bitcoin trading is a dominant activity in Japan. A 2018 report by the country's Federal Services Agency estimated that over 3.5 million traders, or 2.7% of Japan's population, try their luck in the asset class with those in their 20s and 30s, making up 28 and 34% of the total, respectively. So yeah, they're, uh, it's big business over there in Japan, but the cryptocurrency market is really affected by COVID, especially since for a lot of us, the ability to buy things with Bitcoin and Ethereum and things like that has not formal formalized and materialized quite as much as it possibly could have by this point, in which case it kind of delays things and makes people kind of pull their money out. So that way they have it on hand. Um, I know I've you know, stopped investing a lot in cryptocurrencies just because the wife and I are in a very different financial situation than we were even just five weeks ago. And that was a worse financial situation than what we were in February before all this started. So it's definitely limited me in what I can do. So I'm glad that the market is going up overall, but this pinch is probably going to continue until the underlying factors, i.e. Corona, uh, is resolved. So. Alrighty, that was article number five. All right, let's hop over to uh, number six. So, China, the People's Bank of China, developing this lovely uh, digital currency, and it's reported they're kind of using it to chip away at some competitors in the country. So it's reported, reportedly planning to use its digital currency electronic system, or DCEP, just another moniker for this uh, central bank digital currency or CBDC. Oh yeah, they love the monikers. Uh, it's to target the dominance of technology giants like Alibaba and Tencent in the digital payment sector. The port comes only a few days after claims of the central bank, prompting a top antitrust agency to launch a probe against Alipay and WeChat Pay for using their dominance to suppress competitions. Um, as of now, Alibaba's financial subsidiary Alipay and Tencent's WeChat Pay control majority of the digital payments across China. I believe combined they represent like 80 some percent of the market or more. So it is kind of a lot. So according to the details received by the Financial Times from several outlets familiar with the central bank strategies, the People's Bank of China, or PBOC, will use the DCEP to provide banks equal opportunities in the field of digital payments as it earlier did to technology giants. Uh, in a separate statement, a senior official from the Hong Kong Monetary Authority familiar with the matter said, they, PBOC, want a more level playing field for the banks. Retail payments are so dominated by Alibaba and Tencent, while banks are less active in the electronic payments, and they can control banks better. Uh, that's not in the article. That's just my opinion. So, at the peak of its hype in March, several reports stated that Alibaba and Tencent were both an active part of the Digital Lawn Project. However, last month, a report from South China Morning Post suggested that China was launching its digital currency as an alternative payment option. Now look, they will probably integrate into Alipay and WeChat Pay the digital currency. It just makes sense. But they are very large. They do have a very, in my opinion, insane amount of market share in this sector that China probably does want to counteract and create, you know, a more level playing field. The more competition you have, theoretically, the better the products will become as firms compete with each other and bounce, not ideas off each other, but like, you know, when one company develops something, it makes the other company go, well, oh, crap, we gotta, we gotta do that. And so then they'll, they'll push for their own development of it 
and maybe they discover something while they're developing it that improves it and then they launch that product and it makes everyone else go ah crap now we got to figure out how they did that and it just kind of builds upon itself and innovation is the result so that's probably what china is trying to artificially do uh, which they've had a lot of practice in doing so it'll probably work out for them quite honestly but alibaba and tencent will they'll integrate the digital the digital currency once it's out they just will um, and then we'll all go from there and watch and see what this does for China. Um, it's going to be an interesting test case because they're going to be the first ones, it looks like, to successfully implement this project. And it's definitely going to be something for all of us to watch. But all right, hopping on over to number seven. Uh, so IOTA and STM, they're trying to make the Internet of Things more accessible. So earlier this year, ST Microelectronics and IOTA announced their intentions to further expand the existing partnership. One of the goals is the logical combination of royalty-free microtransactions via IOTA and the large amount of small data volumes that microcontrollers are expected to transmit in many areas of the application. So there's a middleware solution for X, called Xcube IOTA 1 it has already been offering various possibilities for several months to turn these microcontrollers into fully functional IOTA nodes. Um, the it's a very flexible program or package, but it also requires high effort to set it up. So they're dropping this new function pack, which is FPSNS IOTA 1, dear lord, it has a number of predefined functions. For examples, it allows easy setup of transmission data on motion, temperature, pressure, and humidity at adjustable intervals on the tangle. Basically, there's this version that you can do pretty much anything with, but you got to figure it out for yourself versus this FPSNS, which has little less utility, but it's much easier for someone to figure out. So apart from the convenience the package is intended to offer experienced developers when testing and calibrating new applications, it is also declared goal of STM to make it easier for less experienced developers to get started with IOTA based Internet of Things on the one hand and the in-house microcontrollers on the other. So basically here's this first step that you can kind of use to explore and play around with different things and once you're comfortable you can upgrade to our premium package which you can do so much more with. I like it. It makes sense in its own way. Um, I'm pretty excited for what this will continue to bring for IOTA. I like the project overall pretty well, um, and it definitely helps adoption. So, cool little tidbit in there, just drop that on over. So, alrighty, so Brad Garlinghouse, CEO of Ripple, as we've already talked about him once today, we're just going to dig in a bit more. We're going to talk about the US dollar kind of on us. Alright, so global populations continue to lose confidence in fiat currency. Uh, while well, the U.S. dollar will remain the world's reserve currency in the near future, it's getting increasingly weaker. At the same time, cryptocurrencies are significantly outpacing the U.S. dollar in terms of increasing their value. Yeah. So, uh, Brad went had a nice little thread. So he stated, a year ago, many called crypto a scam, and now a majority of governments are looking seriously at blockchain. It addresses frictions that were assumed very hard to solve before. Crypto is up 80% while the USD is down 3 year to date. Uh, the US government's unprecedented fiscal stimulus efforts, and they are unprecedented, in the wake of the coronavirus pandemic could lead to the devaluation de of the US dollar. I'd argue that it already has, but you know, whatever. Uh, Garlinghouse added that traditional monetary systems are usually as strong as people's trust in them, and yeah, I agree with him. At the end of the day, that trust is really getting broken in this financial, traditional financial system. That's the theme. The less trust you have in the dollar, the more you want alternatives. I 120% agree with him on this. There is a large... Um, issue going on right now with how the United States is trying to prop up the economy. Um, it's basically robbing Peter to pay Paul. You know, they're, they're printing all this money to solve this coronavirus problem, but once it's finally over, the problems that the stimulus have created will then cause more problems, um, which then they'll have to figure out a different way how to counteract. So it, 
it's not a good situation, but at the same time, I don't know what else they could have done. So in that, that sense, I don't blame them, but they're right. Your growing house is right. The amount of faith that you place in a monetary system is how strong it is. And people are losing faith in the US dollar and they're increasingly looking at blockchain as an alternative. So it's good for all of those of us in this space, but I don't know what it's gonna mean long-term for how the United States and many other countries around the world do. Um, the strain is getting kind of interesting. So, uh, yeah, but that's enough of that. Let's hop over to article number nine, just a quick one. Hey, over 90% of you ether holders is in a state of profit. So good for you guys. So as Ethereum continues to hit new 2020 highs, the majority of Ethereum is reportedly profitable. According to data from blockchain intelligence firm Glassnode, more than 90% of circulating Ethereum is now in a state of profit. So good for you guys. According to Glassnode, the last time ether saw this level state of profit was in February of 2018 when it's trading at 925 bucks. Boy, if only, right? Uh, currently trading at 391, it briefly crossed the $400 price threshold on August the 2nd, according to data from Coin360, following steady growth in 2020. Uh, this altcoin is up more than 200% since the first of the year. Yeah, don't really have too much to say to that, other than congrats to all of you who've been accumulating Ethereum over the past th few years. I'm in profit, and I hope uh, everyone listening is. I know statistically one in ten of you isn't. For that, all I can say is just keep holding. It'll get back there. So, yeah, that's all I got. Uh, but we'll round things off with a pretty interesting thing. So, uh, the token Tendies, God, uh, based, on the, based on Ethereum, rises more than 400% in the last four days. Its trading volume on exchange protocol Uniswap exceeded 4.5 million and actually was more than Tether and Chainlink. So, uh, the token Tendies has become the new focus of Ethereum's DeFi sector. 10 started on July the 30th, the price of 18 cents, and rose to 82 cents. Uh, the token is being promoted as the next generation autonomous and hyperinflationary coin. For those of you who don't know, Tendies is some 4chan meme that they've now turned into a coin name. So this is, this is a joke coin. Like this is straight up a joke coin, just, I'm just letting you guys know I want to talk about it because this article is just it's insanity to me and it makes me laugh but just know this coin is probably a scam not intentionally but it is a scam coin and long term it is going to kaput like just just know that okay so at the same time that it exceeded this. Ethereum's DeFi sector exchange protocol Uniswap reports the token has seen a fast, a very fast surging trade volume. Ugh. So Tend ranks above tokens that have shown absorbing gains in the last month, such as Synthetics and Aave. And Le Tend records a trading volume of $1.8 million in the last 24 hours. Like, I just. Oh, God. Just so funny. So Tendies operates with smart with a smart contract that includes a feature that sends 4% of the token that is placed on the liquidity pool in Uniswap to two different addresses. The first address receives 51% of the funds and is used to burn that amount. The second address receives the funds that are distributed with a reward pool called Tendies Bucket. <laughs> God. God. Uh, any user can drain the pool and receive 1% rewards. Dear Lord. Uh, Tendies has a supply of 9 million tokens in Uniswap, and these funds, according to the official website, will not have a single owner. Yeah, so with the launch of Uniswap V2 fund are not accessible by any team member, the smart contract ensures no one controls can control any Tendies. Initial liquidity pool will be provided 100% from pre-sale funds. Ugh. So recently, Poloniex enlisted Tendies, dear lord. Uh, and additionally, they announced it will launch a competition supported by the Tendies community called My Good Boy Tendies Colonel. <laughs> oh my god, I can't believe they did that. Uh, to compete, users must send a quality of 10 to the Poloniex Tendies Bucket at polotendies.eth. The funds collected will be sent to the Tendies Bucket reward pool and distributed to winners. The tokens listing in Poloniex has not been positively received by the crypto community, defined as a social experiment by its creators. 
Attendees is perceived as a very high-risk asset. In addition, some accuse it of being a Ponzi scheme. I don't doubt that either. It seems too good and too insane to be true, so it probably is. But hey, that does it for 10 of the trending articles in the crypto news space today. Thanks for being here with me. Let's take a look at top 10 coins. Uh, Bitcoin's pretty flat. Ethereum's down a percent and a half. XRP's down 3.37%. That's not too big of a deal since they did have quite the week. Bitcoin Cash is down by 1.8%. Bitcoin SV is pretty flat. Litecoin's down by 1.5%. Um, Cardano's up 4.43%, but it's chilling down at number 8. It was number 6 at one point, so it looks like it's pretty close. Litecoin and Cardano, they could probably flip back and forth a few times today based on their market cap. Chainlink is coming in at number 9 because it's up 11% at $9.44. And Binance Coin is down by 1.4. Otherwise, uh, we're starting to see, you know, top 20 coins are pretty, pretty green. VeChain's up 8%. Uh, Tezos is up 5%. Otherwise, pretty flat. Crypto.com coin is down 7%. They did have an announcement that uh, wasn't high enough on the trending list to be worth me talking about, but it sounds like it didn't go well. Maybe we'll talk about it tomorrow if it's still kicking around. But alrighty, thanks for making it this far. If you have, please subscribe. It really does help me out. You have no idea. And always links down in the description to check out everything and do your research for yourself. I'll talk to you all tomorrow. Peace. <laughs>